Last time we met, we were talking about problems with Marxist theory and practice, and we were on the section having to do with um, the fact that liberal democracy and capitalism changed in ways that Marx didn't predict. It changed in ways that helped forestall any sort of revolutionary activity in industrializing countries. And so what we see is the revolutions, when they did happen, happened in ag agricultural societies, societies that had not industrialized or not very much, which is not what Marx and Engels predicted would happen. So we were looking at some of the ways in which liberal democracies did change um, in their policies and practices and their economics. We talked a little bit about economics right before we left, but certainly uh, instead of narrowing into ever increasingly small number of people doing business in capitalist societies, business expanded. Well, that's quite obvious now. It took a long time for it to get this big, though, uh, but uh, we see more and more and different kinds of businesses developing at all levels from corp huge corporations all the way down to small business, all surviving side by side. Yes, there are problems with it, but certainly it did not develop in the way that Marx and Engels predicted, leading to a sort of desperation uh, situation. Here are some of the other things that, uh, that emerged. Uh, and we talked about these, but I think I'll start here just to sort of review because I like to do that, uh, whatever I left off on. We find that unions, um, instead of becoming irrelevant, as Marx and Engels thought, actually became a source of power for the working class and uh, did work, especially in times when labor supply was in short supply, to raise the wages and better the working conditions of, of people. Countries develop minimum wage laws and all sorts of laws actually dealing with um, how many hours in the day people could work, um, whether they had to receive overtime or extra pay for extra hours that they perform and so forth. Um, the capitalists got a little bit more savvy as time went by too because they did understand that unless they paid their workers a decent wage, one, they wouldn't be able to keep them. Uh, in certain situations where the workers were in demand, okay, uh, and also that they would not have enough consumers, that there was a value in paying people a little more in order to not have that situation develop that Marx and Engels predicted of the crisis of overproduction. Um, there was a growing understanding that people who stay in the job longer and develop in that job are better workers and are actually a better deal for the employer. And work changed so that skills mattered more. So the longer that you stay in a position where skills are required, the more valuable an employee you are. It's not so easy to discard a person and exchange them for another person if the training and the skills necessary for that job are pretty, pretty lengthy and pretty difficult, okay? Now Marx and Engels predicted that technology was the worker's enemy. Uh, that the more technology that was used in the manufacturing process, the more workers would be out of jobs. It was sort of like a one-to-one -one ratio where if you lost, if you got a machine to do a job, you lost a worker. And uh, what actually happened as time went by is with technology changing, more and different types of jobs were produced using the technology, producing new technology and so forth. And actually, that seems to be what the economy runs on now, is the ever-changing and in, in, uh, improving of technology. OK, so in a lot of ways, capitalism and capitalists and workers all changed in ways that Marx and Engels didn't anticipate. And that made people more satisfied not completely satisfied. I mean, even in today's economy, there are still people, plenty of people who aren't satisfied. But we're talking about dissatisfaction leading to revolution. And capitalism changed in ways that did not lead to the misery of enough people to produce those revolutionary moods. Yeah? But would the fact that the early unions at the turn of the century required violence to be effective or even to be noticed? Somewhat, some relevance, but they didn't 
totally rely on violence and they didn't rely on violence forever. And their strongest times were times when they didn't rely on violence. But they were considered illegal for a while. Yeah. And then the fact that they were illegal. Right, but they kept going and they kept changing and they became legitimate parts of the system. You know, the system tried to fight them. They fought back. They became legitimate actors in the political system and so he made a lot of gains. Didn't anticipate that. No, I don't think so. Well, well, he did in a way because he, they were violent back then too. He just didn't think that they were that they had enough power to get the job done. Okay? They did things like destroy machinery and create work blockages and things like that, but their, but their situation at the time was that they were just less powerful despite all that, and they could be replaced so easily. You know? But times change, you know, and the value of work go, gets, uh, you know, hot goes higher, and uh, you know, the cost of putting these people down or dealing with them goes up, and so, you know, it, because times changed, they became more effective. But yeah, I mean, he, he they understood that but unions could use violence, but could they use enough violence to overturn the system? Marx and Engels never thought that they would be able to do that, and they didn't. Okay, they didn't do that. But they did affect the system a lot more than they thought they would. Okay. Any other questions about unions or anything else before we move on? Okay. Um, working conditions in capitalist countries improved. Compared to the Industrial Revolution period, where there, were real, there was really no concern for worker safety, as time went by, countries did adopt regulations and laws concerning workplace safety in order to, first, make the workplace more safe, and secondly, to provide a safety net, a way for people um, if they were injured in the workplace to make a claim, to make some sort of claim, either with the business or with the government, in order to safeguard them against the catastrophic effects of, of uh, accidents. Technology actually changed in such ways that manual labor uh, became easier as time went by. Less of it was needed. Okay. Um, it wasn't as hard and as long as, uh, as it was during this period of time. And of course, countries adopted child labor laws, <coughs> uh, which was obviously a major improvement in the situation for children. And at about the same time, they started talking about uh, public education, which at first was provided just in the lower grades, and then as time went by, the amount of public education that was guaranteed to people continued to rise. When my parents were um, kids, I believe that they had to go to school through the uh, fifth grade or something close to that. Um, so things have changed a lot in a short period of time. Um, anyway, the, the overall point here is that liberal democracies were able to adjust towards the workers and the workers' concerns in a variety of ways. And this was largely due to the fact that the workers did have power, that they the vote that they had, especially as they got organized, mattered more. And they were able to have their voice heard in the system. And even though there were a lot of competing interests and big business continued to have a lot of power, the workers' interests could not be totally uh, ignored. And in some cases coincided with the interests of business. Now remember, the key to the revolution was Incredible misery, because uh, like a lot of theorists of revolution, Marx and Engels understood that people would never be desperate enough to take matters into their own hands en masse unless they were absolutely miserable, absolutely alienated and uh, poor. But capitalism, again, developed in ways which produced a more solid and broader middle class. And instead of a narrowing upper class, a larger upper class. There were still poor, there will always be, okay? but the middle class expanded and became a major political force in society. And that middle class had an interest in keeping things basically the way they were, because they were comfortable, they were fairly satisfied with their situation. Now, what happens when you have an expanding middle class and an expanding upper class? In liberal democratic societies, that meant more taxes, okay? more revenue coming into the government, more revenue that the government could do things with. And when you combine that with the increasing voting power 
of the middle and lower classes, what you have is a variety of government programs to provide that safety net for the poor and for the elderly uh, that people demanded. Okay, so not just in our country, but in all Western liberal uh, <clears throat> democracies, we have a form of social security which protects people in their old age or in case of disability. We have medical services provided to the poor. And right now, of course, in this country and many others, there's an expansion of those medical services um, to a lot of people. Well, at least that's what, what we're talking about. Welfare programs. Welfare programs increased and expanded into job training programs, uh, programs to help people get more training, more education, and so forth. So the governments responded to the people's needs, but in a way that supported the overall capitalist system, okay? To keep people out of absolute poverty helps the capitalist system. The more absolute poverty there is, uh, the more it drags down the entire system. Okay? To help people get an education helps the capitalist system because people become more productive and so forth. These types of programs also blunted the misery, the pain of poverty. Okay? Now, contemporary Marxists will say these are programs which capitalist countries created in order to sort of uh, minimally satisfy the poor so that they wouldn't be outraged enough to revolt. Okay? Well, that's, in a way, I mean, that's the effect of it. Right? That's one effect of it. Okay? Depending on how you look at it, it could be seen that way. It supports the system, okay, definitely. Um, on the other hand, there's a growing emphasis on getting people off of welfare and into work and being productive, which would seem to sort of go against uh, the more cynical view. When you get a middle and upper class that's growing, you get more charitable giving. And in this country and elsewhere, uh, in Western capitalist countries, wherever there's prosperity, there's more charitable giving. And there's a massive amount of it in this country. And that also helps uh, the poor. OK. So what we have then is a situation where most people are better off than they were by far during the Industrial Revolution. And even because of the variety of uh, social welfare programs and guarantees that we have, even the poor are more secure by far than they were during the Industrial Revolution. And all of that results in a lack of profound dissatisfaction. Okay? Yes, there's dissatisfaction, but not profound enough to argue against the system as a whole and to want to change it for another system. Okay? One of the things that people are enjoying now in greater and greater numbers than ever before is private leisure time. One of the greatest complaints that Marx and Engels had against the capitalist system of the time was that everybody you know, in the working class was working so hard and so long, they had no other life. It was just sheer drudgery. Okay? And there was nothing to live for except for survival. Well, that is a situation that would throw people into desperation. But as people worked fewer hours and had more buying power, they were able to pursue leisure in a way that the working class people had never been able to do before in human history. And uh, that continues today. And again, when people have leisure time, they don't have to get all their satisfaction from their jobs. Remember that Marx and Engels said, work is life's prime desire. And when it's no good, when it's tedious and so forth, that's terribly alienating. Okay? But it looks like more people in this type of system get satisfaction outside of work as well as in work. Maybe the work is minimally satisfying, but they've got a family life now. They have time that they can spend uh, with their family. They can pursue hobbies and so forth. Um, so that is, a, that is a situation that Marx and Engels did not predict and could not anticipate uh, happening within capitalism. 
Now, I put this down here even though, you know, uh, as a social scientist I have to say most people still don't exercise their rights meaningfully, uh, but that's their choice more now than it ever has been in the past. Okay? If people have leisure time to watch TV and play video games and go to movies and go shopping and so forth, they could have the leisure time to participate in the political system more now than ever before. And many of us do. Uh, we are better educated, we are more informed about what's going on with our government, and if we want to, we have the ability and the means to participate by speaking up, writing a letter to the editor, getting involved in a community group uh, that wants to make some sort of change. Um, we have that opportunity. A lot of people still don't take it, uh, but it's an opportunity that people never had in the past because they were illiterate, because they were working too hard, because the last thing they needed or could have on their mind is what the government was, was doing. So that too has uh, changed in a positive way for people. All right. So capitalism, though it has its problems, and we'll talk about those more in a little bit, capitalism is something very different from what Marx and Engels predicted it would be. It has done many things that they never thought it could. Okay? It has adjusted in a lot of ways uh, to people's needs, and it has produced far more prosperity than they would have ever thought possible. All right, another problem with communism is its real world history. Um, now, Marx, of course, predicted that revolutions would happen in capitalist countries, but as I've said, they did not. They happened in poor, mainly agricultural countries. And of course, the first was the Soviet Union, this huge, huge country, uh, which was mainly farming in, its, in, in what it produced, farming, and um, in which most people did not even know that the revolution had happened when it happened. They were not involved. Um, this was not the scenario that Marx and Engels thought would, would come about. In those real-life communist revolutions, the theory of communism was not used as a way to check whether the government was doing the right thing or not, but was rather mainly used as a ideological or propaganda tool for a dictat dictatorial government. Now, I've used the term totalitarian up there, and I don't believe I defined that yet, but totalitarianism is a system of government which seeks to control all aspects of people's lives, not just their workplace behavior or their economic uh, behavior, but the way they think, what they believe, what they support, and so on. Communist governments were totalitarian in that regard. They try to control every aspect of people's lives. They didn't want them to have religion, for instance. They didn't want them to have free speech. They produced a lot of propaganda to support the government, and that's all the people had um, access to. Communist theory, Marx and Engels, were made use of in these systems by the government to justify the totalitarianism. If they had remained true to Marx and Engels' wishes, these governments would not have turned out the way they did. What did they do? Well, probably the most, the greatest problem with these systems was that they made people completely dependent on the state. In other words, they couldn't make any money, have a livelihood outside of the state and its control and what it provided for them. Once that situation was put into place, then the state had the power to do all the other things that we've talked about under Stalinism and under communism uh, generally. To intimidate people, to spy on them, to throw them in prison for political uh, offenses, or simply to terrorize them. All of that is possible when people have no sort of out, outside source of control over their lives. <clears throat> what we see from these experiments in the Soviet Union, China, 
Vietnam and, and uh, North Korea, um, all these different places, Cuba, okay, is that human nature in the systems that were set up did not change. Now, that may not be surprising because the systems were not sincerely communist in their structure. Okay? There was no attempt to make everybody completely equal or to make people free. There was an attempt to control people and keep people in their place. Uh, but nevertheless, they did do a lot of trying to educate people. Okay? They used the education system for their ideological purposes, uh, telling children that everybody was equal, that everybody was a communist comrade, and that they should work for the system. But none of that produced an egalitarian society. And in fact, nothing seemed to be able to get that competitive spirit out of people. But whereas the competitive spirit comes out in capitalism with people trying to make money, and, and some people getting far wealthier than others, and that can produce a lot of harm. Okay? But in the capital, in the communist system, they couldn't compete with money. Okay? But they competed politically. The competition was about who was the most loyal to the communist system, who could impress the leadership the most with their loyalty, okay? with their usefulness as well to the, to the political system that was in place. So the Communist Party itself became a forum for competitiveness. And uh, those who were successful in this competition were given many rewards for their loyalty and for their usefulness. Special privileges went to those in the higher ranks of the Communist Party. And in particular, that meant having a nicer home, maybe a second home in the countryside, being able to shop, at stores where there was Western goods for sale, uh, eating at better restaurants, having access to entertainment. Okay. All of these things were reserved for those who had managed to find a way to you know, pull themselves up through the ranks of the Communist Party. In this type of system, the ideologically closed system, where only one ideology uh, is allowed and everybody is measured against it, other forms of merit don't count and can actually work against you. Being too educated, if you're broadly educated, definitely works against you. Uh, being skilled or highly talented can make a person appear dangerous uh, because they might think something other than the prescribed thoughts that they're supposed to think. Talent, then, was something that the Soviet Union, for instance, had a hard time dealing with. It tried to co-opt people who were artistically, philosophically, mathematically, scientifically talented and give them things, uh, give them a better lifestyle so that they would continue to work for the system. But these people were the most likely to become dissidents, people who fought the system, disagreed with it, tried to escape it, uh, made it look bad. And so, um, the Soviet Union and other communist countries are always trying to suppress those very people who would otherwise be a great strength for their country, the scientists, the artists, uh, the uh, authors, and so forth. They were a major problem. Now, that's a strange type of system where the most intelligent and talented among you are threats to the system and, some, and people to be suppressed. Okay. But that's exactly what, uh, what happened. Merit was actually a drawback unless you could really prove that you were absolutely loyal to the communist system and were not going to criticize it in any way. Art and music and uh, theater was particularly dangerous because there were so many ways that people could communicate their dissatisfaction with the system in subtle ways. Okay? That, uh, that could be argued about. What is the statement in this poem, for instance, or in this play? And so particular attention was paid to those artistic types to make sure that they did not uh, somehow embarrass communism. And before I go on, just to give you an example of the hostility towards intellectuals that can occur in a communist system, in communist Cambodia in 1978, 
uh, when the Khmer Rouge took over, which was a radical communist group, took over the country there. Uh, one of the first things they did after they sent everybody out of the cities to live in the countryside uh, was to kill those who were educated or who even appeared to be educated by even wearing glasses. People who wore spectacles were killed. Uh, anybody who was a professional was killed. Everybody who was a teacher was killed. Okay? Leaving the country completely unable to cope with its situation because it had basically uh, uh, destroyed its own, its completely its intellectual class, its ability to do medicine, to do education, uh, science, and so forth. All right, um, here's another problem. Uh, this is also with real life communism. Marx and Engels, of, of course, predicted that uh, actually that religion would go away during capitalism that people would become so miserable uh, and that the situation would be so dire that they would not be able to believe in a god in their religious framework. Um, and so that would prepare the way for communism because once people let go of their religious beliefs they would be able to see how they could change their situation instead of just relying upon, upon God. Well, um, I don't know if that can happen. The religious impulse is a very strong one. It has survived through the whole of human history in one form or another. But in real life communism, uh, it, it certainly didn't cease to exist. Marx and Engels, or actually just Marx, wrote an essay called On the Jewish Question, just to give you an idea of how Marx and Engels saw uh, religion. Remember that Marx himself came from a Jewish family, and so what it meant to be Jewish and whether to be Jewish was an immediate personal question for him, um, as well as a social question. In this essay, he deals with it primarily as a social question. And he's saying to Jewish people, your religion, just as Christianity, is something which holds you back and which keeps you from seeing uh, your true situation, which is that you're just as a, a member of the working class like everybody else. Okay? Judaism is a stumbling block, the same way religion in general is a stumbling block. And, and Marx even uh, goes so far as to say that Judaism, it supports the capitalist system because he identifies it with materialism. Uh, so Marx reflects the anti-Semitic um, stereotype of Jews in this essay. Um, he says that Jews are calling out for more recognition and rights within the liberal state. They have been denied it. They've been denied these things because of discrimination. And what they want is to be included in the system, in the economic system as well as the political system, like everybody else. But he says that is a, a not a good enough goal. In fact, it's a mistaken goal. They are fighting for an illusion, the illusion of democracy. Democracy for themselves. But democracy, as you know, for Marx and Engels, was a sham. It didn't really give people any power. It didn't really give people any rights. So Marx says to Jewish people, wake up and realize that Judaism is just simply another opium of the masses. It's just another illusion, and it helps to support the overall system. He said their true interests lie with the working class the same as everybody else. Okay? And that's how Marx viewed religion generally, as a stumbling block, as an illusion, as something that supported uh, capitalism and exploitation. <laughs> Marx and Engels looked at America and its freedom of religion the First Amendment uh, right to free exercise of religion and the separation of church and state. And he criticized America, although you would think at first that maybe he wouldn't because the state is free of religion, so, so to speak, and religion is free of the state. But Marx realized that it was in this situation where religion could thrive, where people felt free to worship as they chose and where um, religion was generally regarded as a positive thing by the general population. 
So religious neutrality, the separation uh, of church and state, was actually a situation in which religion could flourish. And Marx and Engels thought that was a bad thing until Americans could free themselves from their religious illusions, they too would not be free. Okay. So that's how uh, Marx and Engels saw American liberalism. Religion simply supported rule by the bourgeois elite in America in the same way that it did in Europe, in their view, allowing people to accept far too much of their bad situation and thinking more of justice in the afterlife and so forth than in this life. Did it ever go away due to misery in capitalism? No. Maybe partly because there wasn't that misery that they predicted. Maybe if there had been that continual misery, there would be less belief. We don't know. Okay. We do see, though, in other parts of the world that poverty does not usually translate into a lack of belief in whatever religion prevails in a country. In fact, poverty actually seems to make people believe more okay, or want to believe. Catholicism, for instance, in Latin America is strong. Okay. Uh, Islam in areas of the Middle East that are poor is still extremely strong. Okay. So there isn't this necessary relationship, poverty to uh, lack of religion. In the Soviet Union, the state did its best to discourage people from being religious. It closed a lot of churches, but not all churches. The Soviet Union was always sensitive to being criticized from the West about being too oppressive. So they did things like they allowed a, uh, some churches to stay open, and then they watched those churches very carefully. In the same way that they allowed the disco in the video uh, to stay open, you know, the only disco in Moscow, but foreigners were allowed to go there. Okay? Um, but they watched it carefully. Uh, they did the same thing with the churches. Um, there were some churches that were open, but those that were open had to abide by all the rules and regulations of the communist state and, uh, and be watched. In the initial revolution, many priests and religious people were killed or fled the country or thrown into prison. There was a continual harassing of anybody uh, who attempted to worship outside of the legal framework that was allowed. And even from time to time, harassment of people who went to those churches that were still available uh, through the state. In uh, China, uh, people continually try to develop what are called home churches where people meet in secret in people's homes and the state continues to try to bust up those meetings and, and uh, punish people who dare to do those things. <clears throat> those who were openly religious were excluded from party membership, which meant that they would never be able to climb up the social an economic ladder as it was uh, as it was offered to people in the communist system. And yet, despite all of these attempts and the continuing propaganda in education that religion was a bad idea or not important or oppressive, <coughs> we found out when uh, communism collapsed in the Soviet Union that religious belief had not died at all. In fact, had not even suffered serious setbacks. Because immediately upon the collapse of that system, people started to retake the churches that had been taken over by the state for government purposes. Um, they immediately started to gather and try to worship in their traditional ways. And uh, the Bible, within a few weeks, was the number one bestseller in the, so the former Soviet Union. Um, it had been uh, banned, of course. So what that says is that even under situations where it's really greatly encouraged, there's this impulse that people have. And of course, the Soviet Union hadn't been around that long. It had been around since 1917. The whole generation had pretty much gone by. But one generation is not enough for people to forget these kinds of things. 
And so there were still a lot of people left uh, that considered religion important and who had managed to retain these beliefs. And of course, the freedom that people got, okay, uh, kind of hard to imagine, but you know, when something is subversive and uh, out of bounds and you can't do it, and then suddenly you're given the freedom to do it, there's a great deal of attraction to that very thing, okay? So that too happened. I mean, it was almost a form of protest that, uh, that people undertook. Okay, any questions before we before we move on? Mm -hmm. Can you define what they generally mean when they call us a liberal state? Mm -hmm. Classical liberalism. Remember when I talked about that, about, you know, by liberal, we, we don't mean um, like the opposite of conservative. We mean a system that is representative, that it's basically democratic, that allows people certain human rights um, and uh, allows people to participate uh, has a constitutional framework, usually a separation of powers. Okay, so that's what we mean by the liberal democratic state. Okay. So in the parallels, the last section, I don't remember exactly mm -hmm. what it was calling it, was calling it, it was the differentiation between the liberal and something else. Uh huh. It's about religion. We're going to talk about that, but it's about how Marx and Engels view um, uh, the founding in America. Not about religion. It's about how they view the founding and how um, the founding is a liberal founding. Okay, and uh, in Marx and Engels' view, uh, they they dislike it as much as they would any other liberal system because they believe that it was a founding for the rich, that the rights that it um, proposed were only for the rich and so forth. But we're we're going to get to that. Um, we're going to get to hopefully today, if not today, then Thursday. There's one more problem that I want to discuss, but to do that, I have to um, I have to provide some background on the overall uh, theory that Marx and Engels are propounding here, which in the textbook is called History as Progress Theory, and I need to explain that again in order to uh, uh, to talk about the last problem uh, with Marx's theory. There are three major ways to view history. Uh, the first is cyclical which you can either see as a circle or as peaks and valleys. In this view of history, there is no absolute progress. There are times of greatness, times when people are prosperous and comfortable and achieve great things, and then there are times when people decline, uh, when they decline into poverty or into uh, decadence and so forth. Some of the peaks of the past from this point of view would be ancient Greek, Greece and Athens, or the British Empire, or the French Revolutionary period. Okay? Um, but those peaks never last forever, just as Greece and Rome eventually faded into, uh, you know, uh, sort of collapsed in a way uh, into darkness, especially the Roman Empire. Uh, they go away, and then another civilization rises up in a different place. Ancient China would be another example of a great civilization. Now, in this theory of history, what causes the peaks are human excellence. It's human excellence. It's the achievement of leaders and of the people who follow them at a particular time. Mainly, the focus is on the leadership. Okay, so that. You know, Periclean Athens, you know, Pericles and other great Athenian leaders, they were the ones that helped raise Athens to military and, and uh, economic uh, power. Okay? Now, the nice thing about this view of history, which is a very common view of his history, is that it assumes that people have free will. By that, we mean that it is the choices that leaders make that produce the success or the failure. They are free to make those choices. And great leaders make good choices that provide their people with the things that they need to flourish and be prosperous. Then there are those, and there aren't too many of them, but you see them every once in a while, who believe that history is really decline, continual decline. From a golden age in the past, to the present, which is seen as decadent. 
And usually, uh, again, you know, it's kind of interesting, Greece and Rome figure prominently here, too. A lot of uh, folks, say, from the 19th century, 19th century historians, look back at those ancient times and said, well, that's when human beings were at their peak, you know, uh, because of all the great art and literature and philosophy and so forth. And uh, then look what happened, you know. Uh, things just, you know, in the Middle Ages, they just went down, you know, into ignorance and poverty and so forth. And, and uh, some people today look at history in this way when they see that uh, even though, say, the West is a very prosperous, uh, we have moral decadence. We have gone from a state of fairly good uh, morality to moral decadence. Uh, or from a relatively peaceful world to a world where war is terribly destructive. From a relatively clean world to a world that is very polluted and, and has all sorts of, of environmental problems. So there are those who see, even though we have made technological and economic progress, that really we're in decline, that we're destroying ourselves, that we're destroying our world, and uh, that we don't see any way of getting out of these uh, problems. Now, again, this view assumes free will. The environmentalist, for instance, who says that we have made, you know, we've made terrible mistakes. We have, we have decided that we're going to, uh, you know, produce as much as possible without any regard for the environmental impact. We're going to, you know, chop down uh, trees without thinking about uh, the impact on the environment or replenishing those supplies and so forth. Um, you know, that all assumes that people could make different choices. Okay? They made bad choices because we're greedy people, okay? but we could make better choices. Okay? Now, a lot, of, a lot of them sound awfully dire and, and uh, so forth, but the implication is we could change. We could change if we wanted to. Okay? We could do things differently. So typically, those who, who believe that history has been about decline still hold out hope for change, although some are very pessimistic. Okay, now, linear progress is a third way of viewing history. And that's the idea that history is, has gone from a low point of relative poverty and barbarism and has continued to advance, not you know uniformly, but over time that you see this great advance. And this point of view looks at, for instance, economics and science and technology and sees such vast improvements in, uh, in all of these things. And even political improvements going from a, uh, systems that are mainly about dictatorship and slavery to a world where there's more and more democratic systems. So this point of view looks at world like this, from a primitive state to a modern state where things really are generally better. Okay? And within this view of history is the vision that perhaps people can achieve, if not perfection, uh, at least close to it, a very a good situation uh, where everybody um, has certain things, a certain level of uh, income, a certain level of health, and so forth. Now, there are two kinds of linear progress. The first one says that that progress is caused by choices again. Okay that is caused by people applying reason to solve problems. Our view of natural science is like this, typically. You know, People have been tackling problems since ancient times, and over time, it, problems have been solved, and those solutions have accumulated right, and produced even more science, more solutions to problems. Okay. All of that assumes free will again. We make choices, and we've made a lot of good choices in this view, and we've learned from our mistakes over time, and that's why we live in a better world today than we did in the past. Thomas More, whom we studied first in this unit, could probably be identified in this category. Okay. 
Now, for him, progress would happen, or would continue to happen, if the leaders of Europe listened to people like him and acted upon reason to, to improve the conditions of the people, to stop being arbitrary and capricious in their treatment of people, okay? uh, providing them with the ability to care for themselves and so forth. He was trying to persuade the powers that be in Europe, including King Henry VIII, that they, that they should uh, make changes which would improve people's lives. His school of thought, the humanists, were sort of precursors of the Enlightenment way of thinking. And the Enlightenment, of course, came along in the, in the uh, 18th century in Europe with the idea that, you know, with enough education, with the right ideas, that societies could just take off, that pretty much all human problems could be solved. Okay. But the assumption of people like Moore or Enlightenment thinkers, such as our own founders or uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau or Immanuel Kant, the assumption is, again, that people make choices and they need to make the right ones in order for progress to occur. But then there's another type of linear progress theory, and that's what we've been studying with Marx and Engels. And it's the idea that there are forces of history beyond human control that push history forward. These forces of history are set in motion by human nature itself, by the way people are. Okay? People are, uh, you know, people are competitive. People want to dominate others. People want material goods. Okay? And it's these basic desires which cause the class conflict that Marx and Engels thought drove history. Okay? These forces of history and of human nature are automatic. Marx and Engels describe a sort of natural selection process, uh, the evolutionary movement from primitivism to the communist revolution. Okay. They don't say that it's about choices of leadership. They say that it will happen regardless of what the leadership does. They can either accommodate the revolution or they can get out of the way and be destroyed by it. It's going to happen. The forces of capitalism have created, for instance, a situation that inevitably will lead to communism. Okay. So we call that type of system of thought deterministic because the idea is that these forces determine the fate of human beings, that we do not have the free will or the choice to change events. Okay? That is their theory. Okay? The forces of history are propelling us forward, and we cannot do anything except for perhaps shape the way these things happen. We can't stop them from happening. For a lot of people, this message was great. It was very hopeful because no one would be able to stop the positive changes that were going to happen. That made people want to be a part of the trend, to be a part of what was going on. Um, and so that type of theory is very attractive on one level, but it is saying ultimately you can't do anything to, to stop this, to change anything. Um, Determinism is kind of the opposite of free will. Okay, now, with that, I can come to the fifth uh, critique of Marxism, and that is its millenarian nature. What we just described when we talk about the forces of history leading to an inevitable end resembles in a way, the Judeo-Christian history or historical concept of the creation of the world, the period of time, massive period of time, where God's story unfolds, and then a second coming in which God comes back to earth and creates a paradise on earth. In the biblical history, even though individual choices are made, that bigger scenario, the big plan, is out of anybody's control. It's foretold before before time began, okay? That's the feel, in a way, of the Marxist theory. And it's possible 
that the millenarian nature of Marxism, the fact that it points to this paradise on earth, this great transformation that is bound to happen, is actually the most dangerous aspect of the theory. If that great transformation is going to happen, that paradise on earth is going to be brought about, then any price may be acceptable as the price to pay for that transformation. If it's going to happen, you can't fight against it anyway. How can you object? And what are claims of justice or morality or humanity in the wake of this huge tide of history? So the millenary nature of, of this ideology can justify either standing back and just allowing the revolution to happen and the excesses of that revolution, or actually taking part in the revolution and committing crimes, because after all, there is no stopping it. And the promise that it holds out for people is so fantastic that it would seem some death, some suffering is trivial compared to the promise of the future. After all, we're talking about something close to heaven on earth. If it actually existed and people actually got to the point where they would completely share and help each other, never be selfish, support each other's development, give freely of their time and so forth, it would be like heaven on earth. And for that, and especially given the sort of deterministic nature of the theory, so what if in the process of achieving this, a lot of people are killed? We're talking about the total transformation of human history. In real life communism, this sort of played out in the worship of Stalin and other communist leaders like Mao, the state worship that was developed at the, you know, by and for the state itself. And as you saw in the video, there were people who lived in the Stalin period and knew that Stalin was doing some pretty harsh things to people, that dissidents were disappearing, they, you know, thrown into prison, people were being shipped off uh, to labor camps and so forth, but who were able to justify these actions because they lent themselves to the greater good and because we, they could trust Stalin because Stalin was the leader of the revolution, the revolution that was bound to be, that was going to create great things. Surely he knew what he was doing. And Stalin took full advantage of the theory. He repeatedly referred to, quote, dialectical materialism and the idea that the forces of history justified everything that he did. And people were able to accept that. As long as the violence didn't touch them personally, um, they were able to accept the level of violence and tyranny of others. So, some criticize Marxism for being a sort of secular religion. Something that can be so firmly believed in that people will do the most outrageous things in order to be faithful to it and in order to achieve its promises. Okay. Does anybody have any questions to ask about that or about any of these critiques that we've covered? Uh-huh. Um, you're talking about you know, welfare and social security and all that kind of stuff. Is that seen in any way as you know, minus all the time and stuff like that or Marxism? Is that seen in any way as a step toward communism? Or yeah, contemporary um, socialist um, people sometimes do see some of these changes as incremental steps towards socialism. His, his question was, do people sometimes see, say, the development of the welfare state and, and social security and things like that as being um, steps towards socialism or communism? Yes, some of them do. Um, democratic socialist parties in, in uh, Europe 
are, you know, uh, very much pushing for these types of changes, and their and their agenda is to continue to expand these programs to achieve the same results. Okay, so yes, um, but it but it requires a change in the way that the socialists think. They had to adjust themselves to the democratic process. They had to get used to the idea of working within it in order to make changes happen, and maybe also to the idea that democracy wasn't something to get rid of it once they achieve their full results, if they ever do. Okay? They seem to have gotten more comfortable, at least the democratic socialist parties, with the idea of democracy itself, because they've used it you know, to achieve uh, the results. But yes, they, there are many now who see these changes as steps, and they've taken it, what I call an incremental approach, one step and then maybe two years later, you add on to that, you expand the program, you create more public space, you know, public um, um, power and so forth. Mm -hmm. Any other questions before we move on? Okay. I think it's interesting to wonder whether socialism with democracy would be a far different thing and is a far different thing than um, communism without democracy. You know, one of the most lethal things about the communist theory is that it, it so discounts the possibility of democracy doing anything good that it opens the way for total dictatorship, you know. So it's saying, you know, you can't, you know, voting uh, is no good. You can't achieve anything that way. So let's get rid of democracy. Well, when that happens, uh, then, you know, the, the government is free to do whatever it wants to to people. Okay, anything else before we move on and talk a little bit about the parallels? I don't think I'm going to have too, too long to do this, though, because somebody's coming in to do tea valves, I think. But any other questions so far? Okay, well, then I wanted to at least start uh, with the, the parallels readings today, and then I'll no doubt have to finish this up on Thursday. But the first reading in the parallel section on Marx has to do with education. And what I'm trying to do in the parallels is to provide ways in which the theory that we're covering still is relevant today. Obviously, we've just gotten done talking about all the ways in which Marx's theory doesn't fit, didn't work, uh, didn't you know, predict the right things, and so forth. Uh, but there are still ways, even today, and democratic socialism is one of them, but there are still things today that uh, I should say areas of thought that use Marxist ideas in order to make a point. And basically these are places where one idea is used instead of the overall theory. Okay? Um, one of those areas in education has to do with grading and the whole idea of how do you get students uh, to want to study and to work hard and to do their best in school and actually learn. And actually, for decades now, there's been this debate, ever since at least the 60s or 70s, there's been this debate about, you know, are grades really uh, the way to motivate students? Now, remember that Marx said about pay, that pay was a sort of punitive thing. If you didn't work hard, you didn't get as much pay, or you didn't get paid at all. In order to get paid enough to survive, you had to work hard, and so forth. Pay becomes a method of control over people. And that makes work look uh, bad, it makes work look like uh, it's not pleasant. Nobody wants to do it, but they have to do it because of the pay. Right? Well, the same thing applies to grades with this critique of the traditional grading system. Give me one minute and I'll leave. Um, the idea here is that grades are a form of pay, and they're just as negative and punitive. Okay? And we're saying to students, Study hard and do your best on this test, or you're going to get a C, D, or F. Okay. And uh, the question then is: Is that a positive incentive, or does that actually turn students off to education? Okay. So uh, when I come back on Thursday, I'll start up with that. And uh, please stay, because uh, Svetlana is going to do T vows now. Um, the room number is 244. Uh -huh. Yeah.